start. If you need a copy of the you know, relative, let me Now that Jeff is here, we can begin. I'll get some more lunch. And if you need a copy of the Philip Dr. Midwifery, I have those as well. I'll sell you a hard copy for 50 bucks. How about that? And all those are here. Autographed for twice the price. That's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. How's your world? Three more. I'll get a other than that, right? It's real. Who's Arnold Herman? I used to take the battle. I'm ready. Put it somewhere over here. Later. Yeah. Oh, no, he's got the type. <laughs> <laughs> Another JG? Okay. This is going to be a rather curious challenge. And it started with the Balboas, so therefore if there's any criticism at all, <laughs> we know who it should be directed against, right? The Balboas. They started this by sending out a copy of their translation of the Parmenides. <laughs> that began a study group. And so we've been coming together early morning for a couple of years. And everything was normal, just a study. And the second person who I think you should be aware of who's caused us this headache is Regina. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So. She looked at the dialogue and the translation and she said, isn't this rather curious? And we all stopped and she said, there's the use of the word self <laughs> in this dialogue. Correction. Everything changed. <laughs> Everything changed. I think there's a correction in this one. Then by carefully going over it and seeing how many times we could change the existing translations, plural, we realized that, hey, this is an immensely significant thing. What's significant about it? Huh. It all starts with Xenophanes, who said, Hey, uh, what is it that sees and hears and thinks, see, and thinks? <laughs> he said, because it's, it's something there, the whole of it does that. <laughs> and then various people put in their suggestions of the whole of what. <laughs> Mind, said a couple of people. God, said several people. Parmenides says the self. Okay. <laughs> In every existing translation, there is ignoring of the idea of self. Even to address that question, now how can a whole culture ignore the idea of the self if it's there? Third person to get in trouble. We should get in trouble with Barbara. Yeah. She said, you know, this way of translating just happens to go 
against everything I have been taught and the whole tradition I have been steeped into cannot be true if this is true. It's terrible. But she had courage enough to stay with it. The fourth person had trouble. So we can blame a lot of people on this work. David. David puzzled through several of these very complex passages. And much to all of our surprises, he would come up with a beautiful expression that translates it on the highest level. Uh, again, that gave us a shock because he was able to see it poetically, yet accurately and philosophically significant, all in one. Mm. Now, I myself, I was just a reader in the, <laughs> in the background. Good. Oh, right. The first, I, I, a correction, first guy who noticed that the definition of autos was self. Well, okay, maybe I played a little role in it. We just <laughs> really looked for the but rest look here, of it. See? It is so interesting that we wanted to share it, so we designed this seminar. Now remember, there are four people we can blame all our confusion on. <laughs> forget the fifth, forget what Regina said, I'm just an innocent bystander. Yes, yeah, always. Don't forget Jeff. Oh, all right. All right, here we go. All right, let's take a look at this. In order to play with this dialogue, there are several words we need to really see their significance of, right? Now, while these are important, there's a Greek word that we will use all the time because there's no English equivalent. Right, we see it. The one word that changed everything was this word. So in this dialogue of the Parmenides, Socrates and his group come to visit Parmenides who came a great distance in order to take part in the Panathenaea. And they meet. And that's the occasion when Socrates now is going to examine Zeno's recent thesis. And Parmenides considers, what is this young guy by the name of Socrates doing? He's criticizing my, happens to be my student. And Socrates gives such a devastating critique of it that it looks like it's in shambles. Parmenides turns around and says, hey, Soc, you show a very nice spirit but you lack something, and therefore with that lack you'll never reach truth. In order for you to reach truth, you have to understand the dialectic. You don't understand the dialectic, and that's why you have the confusion you have. Ah. This is a dialectic that's Platonic, therefore it presupposes an exploration through dialogue. Now, we have to see what is significant about these three terms in respect to the self.
you say three terms? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, if we are willing to get into a dialogue with someone to explore something, must you not agree you must show an interest in the self <laughs> of the other person? Like, you want to be sincere. You want to communicate whatever it is that you think is significant. So they're, they're connected together for to get into dialogue is to appreciate that the person you're dialoguing with is worth talking to. They're, you know why they're worth talking about and to? They have one of these things. <laughs> now, look here. What the heck is that? That's what I was going to Well, Socrates comes back and says, hey, wait a minute. If I need to explore this game called dialectic, and you're telling me that I have to go back and re-examine everything I just said about Zeno and take a better look at it because what I did wasn't really, really didn't show much perfection. It was a shallow criticism. Parmenides is telling Socrates, you have to go back and do justice to what you just discarded. Socrates said, oh, that's a hell of a task. Because Zeno's position has 40 separate theses. Socrates went on. Uh, Zeno, why don't you, as a student of Parmenides, give us an example of this dialectic? And Zeno says, not me. <laughs> Matter of fact, I haven't heard of a good exploration of the dialectic in many years, even though my teacher over here, Parmenides, happens to be a master of it. Hmm, that's curious. So Socrates says, okay, Parmenides, why don't you give us an example of the dialectic? Not just an example, why don't you give us your hypothesis? Hey, another word. He says, not just a hypothesis, but your own hypothesis. What does that mean? That means he's asking him to give an intellectual account of what he considers to be the truth. Hey. Hypothesis, therefore, must show Parmenides' logos. That's a strange word. We have to understand what he means by it. Now look here. It's not clear what they mean by logos <coughs> unless we see the way it functions in the dialogue. So we'll put that one aside for a moment. So Parmenides says, I'll tell you what, I'll do it. This is a good crowd. I wouldn't do it if there were a lot of people indifferent to truth, but this is a good crowd. So I'll risk sharing my own hypothesis. What is his own hypothesis? Hmm. the one self. <clears throat> hey, two ideas pulled together into a unity, and then he adds, hey, you know what else? In order to do that, I have to include something. <clears throat> I have to include whether the one is or whether it is not. So his hypothesis is, if the one self can be said to be we also have to ask whether the one is or is not. Mm. Here comes the drama. Simple one. 
<clears throat> we then find that Parmenides, and in those days they drank coffee, Parmenides then unfolds what we are now calling his first hypothesis, which is this. <coughs> Secondarily, this. To do that, what he does is quite remarkable. See this double term? He has an interesting strategy. What he's going to do, he's going to take these and he's going to unfold what he means by the one itself. When he finishes that, this is an exploration with a dialogue with a young chap by the name of Aristoteles. These are the points he makes about the nature of the one itself. What's very strange about this dialogue? <clears throat> he then says, hey, you know what? Let us apply what we have just explored about the one and apply it past these conclusions. Look here. Past these conclusions to the nature of the self. What does that mean? That means he doesn't give any arguments about the nature of the self. What he does is he outlines what he really thinks about the one itself. He pulls all of those together. It's a nice conclusion. And he says, hey, uh, let's apply that and those conclusions to the idea of the self. So he's applying the conclusions. He's applying the conclusions to the idea of the self. No argument. Hmm. Hmm. Hey, this now becomes the heart of the whole dialogue. Aristoteles is brought through this dialogue, which is now called the dialectic. Step by step by step by step, each one of these points that Parmenides makes, he says, yep, yep, I agree. No, no, let me hear about it. Oh, yeah. Then Parmenides unfolds some things about it. Then he says, oh, yes, yes, I got that. And they go on and reason. And then Aristotle says, wait a minute, I'm not clear about that. So Parmenides does some reason and shows him that that is also true. So he has complete agreement. So at the end of the first hypothesis, which is his hypothesis, Aristotle says, hey, you know what? I can go along with you with this. This is OK. <laughs> but I wouldn't apply it to the self. What does Parmenides then do? He says, well, look here. If you don't think that's true, let's deal with the implications of what you're thinking because it looks like you're rejecting this idea of the self. So therefore, he says, look here. I'm going to unfold to you the idea of the self. in terms of two things. See, because here he's talking about the self in itself, by itself, that's just itself. He says, you know what you need? We need to explore the idea of the self as it manifests itself. That's what we do. Wait a minute, because that's not enough.
we're also going to have to show the idea of the self as it interpenetrates the world of becoming. <coughs> that is how the idea of the self functions. See? How it functions in our world. I said, you know what? Well, that's interesting. Uh, in order to put, talk about the self in these three ways, one, two, three, what kind of a world would it be without the idea of the self? What would people do without an idea of the self? What do they do without the idea of the self? Ah! People bind themselves together under some group belief and gain an identity from the group. He said, by the way, uh, it's very likely that there might be some people who lack the idea of the self and uh, don't join groups to gain their identity because they may say that there's just a fundamental gap between whatever is meaningful in our existence. <laughs> I mean, there may be, you see, there may be a God, or there may be an intelligence. Yeah, it may be. But it has nothing to do with our world. That's all. <laughs> yeah, there may be a God, there may be intelligence. It has nothing to do with us. Therefore, there's a split for these people who lack the idea of the self, and now they're reduced to a fundamental dualism. Right? A separation between heaven and earth, between God and man, between intelligence and man. A split. Now look here, this is the most curious thing in the dialectic of Parmenides. Here's the question, how, do you, how can you be sure that these alternatives truly exist? By what reasoning? Hmm. Can you de rationally determine these are indeed the genuine alternatives, and they truly exist. How does he do it? He says, you know what? 
What is, what is a negative? What is a negative proposition? Or negative hypothesis? Hey, it would be very simple to generate what we call a negative hypothesis. All you have to do, if everything you say about any one of these four ideas, just stick a knot in front of it. As it were, a denial, that ends it. No, no, see. That's not what a negative hypothesis is. A negative hypothesis is a way of reasoning that would show <clears throat> that, they, that the author is going to create such a rational description of the absence of a central idea and show, as a result of that, that the positive must exist. Mm. That's a negative hypothesis. Mm. Curious? So if someone says, I don't think the self exists in the way in which you think, well, then there is going to be a substantial and beautiful argument that's going to show its necessity if you want to deny its existence. <laughs> and that argument is going to show you, therefore you have to assume, the existence of the second hypothesis. The same thing is true Hey, that's why he can say that this dialectic is a tool and a way of reasoning that will let you reach truth. Why? Because now you see the rational necessity for your own fundamental beliefs, your hypothesis about the nature of the universe, brought together into a unity and to deny it presuppose its own existence. That's true. Okay, got another problem. Wow. is a wallpaper class. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. How would you describe the way in which your mind functions? Because after you tell me the way the mind functions, then you should be able from that to tell me <clears throat> about what is the nature of the mind. That's all. If you know how it functions, you should be able to tell me what it is, describe it. That's all. So if you answer this, we should also then be able to answer what after all is the mind itself.
<clears throat> now, wouldn't you agree? Hold on, wouldn't you agree I've worked a lot so far? Mm. And that's not usual. Yeah. <clears throat> so I really need some help. <laughs> wouldn't you agree, I mean, people who are relaxed and haven't gone through what we've gone through uh, are likely to be more alert and able to answer questions easier than we, have, we are because we've been struggling trying to understand this strange guy up here. Uh, who just came in the door, by the way? <laughs> oh, 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 our good friend Josh. Josh, uh, how would you define the way the mind functions? Is that only one question or is there another part? <laughs> How would I describe um, providentially and what, what? providentially and beneficial. providentially and beneficially and it's beneficial. Yeah, it's part of those two. Uh, is that the consequence of it or yeah. the way it functions? Mm. Mm. Consequence being the result of its action. Yeah. 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 Oh. But no, I would take that answer back. Yeah, okay. Although I like the answer. You can call on help if you need it. We got Eldar next to me. Who, do you have any <laughs> friends? Eldar and Barbara. Uh. Who are you passing it to? I, I'll, think, I'll sit with the question and get back to you on that one. All right. <laughs> Analogy. What about it? That's how the mind <coughs> functions. It's, that's how, how it functions, through analogy. Uh, Come on, we need help. Uh, <laughs> well, hmm. Say, is, are the odds? Go ahead, think about it. So. Privately. Yeah. Is it likely she's using her mind now? She's looking. Yeah. Yeah. Is it likely that we might be able to observe her mind functioning or just that wouldn't do it? We <laughs> always see as the physical aspect of uh, come up with an answer while we study to see whether we can spot your mind at work. The mind functions like a mirror. Like a mirror. Oh, it's static, just reflects appearances. I see. A spiritual mirror. A metaphysical mirror. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I want to offer caring and intelligible. What is it? Uh, you're asking, yeah. what is the, uh, how does the mind function? Yeah. <clears throat> I want to offer in a caring and intelligible okay. way, and that's actually the same as providence to Josh. Okay. So I, I, sure. Yeah. Ooh. That's right. That word means this. Who's the The mind. The mind functions to reflect upon itself. That's the key. That means, see, that in this exploration, it has a beginning, it has a passageway, middle, has an end. And while it's doing that, hold just one more. While it's doing that, it itself is an active watcher. Not passive. That's your shield. No. Now we have to go back now, you see, and talk about 
What kind of a world Parmenides is talking about when he's doing his hypotheses? So let me introduce a new idea, an old one for all of you. Is it possible that the first hypothesis, which as you all know, starts with negatives, right? If there is a one, is it possible that it could be many? No, it wouldn't be a one if it were many. Oh, well, then it can't be a whole, can it? No, not if a whole has parts, because that would mean it's a many. Oh. Uh, is it likely it would have a beginning, middle, and end? No, those would be its parts, and it can't have parts, so therefore it can't participate in this mind. Oh, can it be in motion? <laughs> it can't be in motion. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because it would mean it would be moving from place to place, and that presupposes places. Oh, could it be at rest? What do you expect it to do? Stay in the same place more than once, that would be a two. Can't be in rest or motion. Hey, wait a minute, is there anything that can be the same as it? No, because that would be two, itself and what it's compared against. Well, can it be like anything? No, it can't be like anything, because it's a pure one. Oh, why is that? Well, because likeness presupposes a relationship with something else, and we just want to talk about the one, not whether or not it can relate to something. Oh, I see. Can it be in time? No, of course it can't be in time. Because time has a beginning, middle, and end, and those would be its parts, or can't be in time. Ah, then he sneaks in when you take all of those conclusions and then say they apply to the self then we have to ask what kind of experience would be equivalent to the nature of the self given all of those negatives? Well, one thing we know in terms of literature, that's the dia the negativa, the idea of God without predicates, a God so noble and perfect that you cannot assign even the idea of existence or predicate to it. It's uh, uh, Nirguna Brahma. It's that kind of Brahma or nature reality without predicates. Oh, wait a minute. That means, uh, that means there can be an ex- a, kind of, a kind of experience called the highest satori or enlightenment. Wait a minute. Is it equally possible that the second hypothesis can equally be matched by some experience? Ah. Hmm. Well. Now the second hypothesis is amazing. We're going to pick up the idea of Usia and the idea of one. Look here, what he's saying is that the one, not the pure one, the one that exists, an existing one,
that uh, that participates in Usia. Remember everything we said about the idea of Usia? <clears throat> okay. He's saying the highest concept, the one. The one that exists, participates in Usia. Well, what would that mean? That means the, now remember, you can use the idea of the divine easily here. For the divine to exist, ah, For the divine to exist, it must be the shadow of a pure one. Uh, it must be, as it were, its reflection. It must stand, it must stand to it the way in which in the visible world we might say a flower is to its perfume or a beautiful object is to its beauty. So look here. We need to explore this as a state of mind. If we do, all right, let me state that right now. In Greek thought, this idea of the pure one is the, uh, I, the perfect idea of God. Ah. Look here, I'm going to play with an analogy I just started with. What do you think of this? <clears throat> as the pure God is to uh, the experience of divine luminosity So too, a flower expresses its scent or perfume or its beauty. <clears throat> Uh-oh, that's one of those words we were going to introduce, analogy. So look, see, that's rather very interesting and curious problem. And then that second hypothesis looks like we might be able to say it's equivalent to the experience of what Plato calls in the Republic the most brilliant light of being. Now the metaphysical problem is, hey, wow. <laughs> uh, 
This is equally a Satori divine luminosity. Mm. This is an experience a pure Samadhi. Mm. Well, then, if that's the case, <clears throat> Then the second hypothesis, the one that is, is participating in Usia. Therefore, people who have this experience of the most brilliant light of being often say, you know what I encountered? I encountered mind, pure mind. Why? Because it has a vitality. Right? It has a obvious sense of intelligibility. Therefore, it has this, the presence of mind itself. And some go further and say, hey, you know what? At that moment, that's the self. All of these words describe that kind of experience, which is the mind knowing the mind. Now look here. Uh, Analogy. The first is to, as the second is to, Pierre, what is the word? Could you read the uh, quote? Saguna, sa means with attributes, na means without attributes, gunas, qualities. So here is Brahmanism and here is Buddhism and the uh, <clears throat> pure sense. Mm. Now wait a while. This is how the mind functions. That's what we're talking about. This is how the mind itself functions. Satori on both of the hypotheses, the first and the second, or do you have Samadhi? No. The bottom one is Kensho Satori. Yeah, but that's Satori and Satori still. Well, there are two kinds of Satori, right? And one is called Kensho Satori. That's said to be a, a modified pure Satori. And therefore, I'm relating that to okay. the second hypothesis. Okay. Because in the history of Buddhism, there are many Zen masters that will not accept experiences of pure light as, as being a pure satori. Mm -hmm. 
other masters will accept it as a kind of satori. Therefore, they make a distinction between those two classes. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. That was Kori Roshi versus uh, Yasutani Roshi in the old days. Uh, look here. If this is the way the mind functions, right, within itself, how does it How does the self enter into our everyday world? Well, so you have how it manifests itself. Now we want to see how it functions in the everyday world, making a distinction between uh, uh, function and manifest. So look. The third hypothesis, what is quite astonishing, is that it starts with the assumption that each moment is self-contained. Just like a camera taking shots every particular frame in a movie, movie uh, screen is a result of particular photographs. Each one is static. It changes. Each one may change, has changed, and you never see motion. You infer motion from the differences in the sequence of the images that you see being flashed on the screen. Where does change come from? Look here. As you look at three strips of film, each one of these is static. Yet, each one is different. There must be differences, no matter how slight, be between each one of these. Therefore, where do, the, where do the things that change go? I, they get, there must be something that gets rid of the old. Oh, wait a minute. Equally well, in each moment, there is something new added. The newness as an immaculate, I mean, just astonishing degree of change, slightest change between each single moment in our existence. I mean, what guarantees that the next moment from now, right now, is going to continue with something that stays the same ah, and something that just changed? How do you account for change? And what's the role of the self? And the third hypothesis, see? Plato comes in and says, I got news for you, tickle you this. There is always, between any two moments, an instantaneous motion. Not in time, an instantaneous motion. It's in that instantaneous moment that is not in time, that's where the mind, the intelligence, the osea functions to permit change. 
it's intelligible because it has to have such precision that the next moment can be exactly what's needed for an ongoing, for an ongoing, right? All of this must have an ongoing telos, a perfection. Must be going somewhere. Overall, must have a perfection. So you put this as an ideal, you put these together, and guess what? That is the self. That is the self as mind, as intelligence, as you see a functioning instantaneously. It's from that and out of which that all change is calculated precisely and it's fulfilling something called the destiny of man. Hey. This is a rather curious view of the self, is it not? What do you think? Ooh. A good beginning. I do that myself. Hmm. It's complex. More. It's... Hmm. Mm. Oh, I like that one too. Well, I wonder, where did it get its... Go ahead. Its... Where did it get its intelligence? Yeah. It is intelligence. Therefore, we now go back and stick in a new word that we forgot. Good. Ooh. That's also the logos. Mm. It, what's the logos? I'm sorry. It is the logos. It is the logos? Oh. Hmm. That is, it contains within it the logos. And it manifests itself in this way. Now, wait a minute. You know what that is? This is real puzzling. Look here. Yeah. Do you have a self? Uh, is it different from your neighbors? <laughs> Wait a minute. Is it one or many? How can it be both one and many? Ah, look here. Here's a problem here. This idea itself, right? Look what we do. Himself, herself, right? Themselves, right? The biggest one, itself, Therefore, there's a class of ideas and would you agree, look here, I can call, I can tell you, what is this itself? What is that itself? I can go around and call everything. Self. Self. Yeah. Now, is that a function of language? Hmm. Wait a minute. <clears throat> But the second hypothesis is saying the self is that. See, now this is also, that's the second hypothesis. Functioning in the third dimension. If you're catching on to this and seeing the possible analogies, 
your mind now is making a connection, Usia, like, oh, now you're seeing some difficulties about this. Therefore, you see, this is Socrates' problem in the Parmenides. He turns to Zeno and Parmenides and says, hey, you know what, I have a puzzle. When I deal with this class of ideas, self, himself, herself, themselves, itself, how do you distribute them? Are we talking about one or many? Is everything the self? Wait a minute. If there is a, a creator, call him Zeus, Hey, does Zeus have a, a self? Or is the name Zeus just for the property of self? To what do you apply self? And how can you be sure that you're correct in what you're doing? Yeah. Take a break. <laughs> Okay, take a break, have a cup, of, right? Get confused for a few minutes, I'll come back. There's a fresh cup of coffee out there, I'm gonna take a look. Thank you. Okay. Astonishing, beautiful. How's your world? How's your world? Um, I don't know. Wow, well, you got wonder with it. Yeah, you're wondering. I'm not entirely sure about that. What's your name? Ocean. Ocean, Pierre. Pierre, right? Nice to see you. Again. 